I'm your moderator today for this session, John Hagen. And um, so we're going to hear from John Fudro from uh, the University of Pittsburgh Library System, who's going to talk about um, standardizing chaos, ETD support service changes um, before and after the pandemic. And so this will be kind of an extension uh, to the panel discussion we heard earlier, and we have some nitty gritty details. So without further ado, please help me to welcome um, John. Okay, I just wanna get my slides up there. Looks like we're good to go. Um, so yes, thank you for having me here today. Uh, I wanted to try and give a little brief history of our program. Uh, we often think of ourselves as somewhat of an outlier in some of the way we have things set up. Uh, in terms, we have a, a decentralized approval uh, system set up at Pitt, uh, and a lot of the, the history came before I took on this position, so I have to speak through what I know of the process uh, and the history of the, of the program. Um, so, let's see here. Uh, ETDs University of Pittsburgh, it was in 2004 that the, the formalized program came about uh, that required an e-degree granting school to, to have an ETD for their graduate students. Uh, and to do that, uh, the libraries were involved. Uh, as of uh, last week, we have uh, 10,102 ETDs uh, deposited in our system. Um, ETDDB was the local instance. So there was the original uh, um, uh, repository system, if you will, that we used uh, to, to consolidate the ETDs that were submitted. Uh, but in 2009, we switched over to ePrints, and that's the current iteration, which is D-Scholarship at Pitt. Um, the overall process and how it was set up was uh, managed by the Office of the Provost. Uh, they had a ETD process group that, that was uh, uh, made up of people from uh, the, the registrar, uh, different units, different departments within the school, and some university library system uh, staff members uh, who, who participated in the, the construction of the process and to develop the policies and the templates and such. Uh, every school that would be required to have a ETDs in the system uh, had at least one main ETD contact. And they were responsible for doing the reviews of the formatting, communicating with the students, uh, approving the forms, and so on and so forth. Uh, but more team members were added as they needed. For instance, our Dietrich School of Arts and Sciences graduates the most uh, students per semester. And they have two people right now, um, but they often, uh, other schools have had uh, graduate student assistants and, and so forth, even if they needed to, depending on the, the, the variety uh, of requirements needed to how they deal with their students. Um, and at the onset, the library was responsible for uh, the repository setup and management. So they said ETDDB to ePrints, uh, but they were there to set up the metadata fields, uh, the workflows that we used in ePrints to facilitate, uh, which again, uh, the student creates the, the record in ePrints. Uh, the is then submitted for review and is uh, partitioned off by their school. So each school's contact is, is basically an ETD admin in our system that they can then go through and give feedback via that system. But I'll talk a little bit about, about that in a bit. Um, but we were also there to help with any changes that need to be made. If there was a new school, school name change, things of that nature. Um, the, we, the libraries were facilitating that rule. Role. The creation of the Word and LaTeX templates were also part of the library's purview at that time. Uh, or they volunteered to do that, and so they created that with their, their knowledge at that time uh, for what was needed. And we actually used a, a student to create the LaTeX template uh, that had been in use and still is technically uh, since 2004. Uh, also, any formatting technical support in workshops that would be given to the students uh, were uh, facilitated by the libraries. So. The student experience, though, uh, it was they were taken to a provost site, the ETD site that used to be out there. We, and, uh, the information, however, wasn't always easy to find. It was a lot of the, the wall of text problem. I, I tend to see it in uh, websites from the two, early 2000s. Um, there weren't a lot of particular guides. And for instance, one of the, the things that I noticed when I first came onto this position uh, and, and looked at the website at the time, they had uh, video tutorials that were PDFs. Uh, which is one of those, those are sort of the issues I make sure I wanted to, to try and fix when we came aboard. Um, the updates to support documentation, uh, they were un, quite infrequent. Uh, and it was a, a chain of who would make the approvals, who would make the changes, and, and the people in charge of the site uh, had to ask their IT uh, representatives to make the changes to the site. So there was a breakdown in the process of how to get timely information, uh, especially if we would have the same website and the same setup. Uh, then, uh, and had a pandemic happen, I would wager that it would take 
a lot longer for them to see the sort of changes that we made. So um, also schools would sometimes alter handouts for specific requirements which is not necessarily a horrible thing, uh, but it could sometimes lead to having a, a version of a form uh, in, in a particular uh, department website that wasn't up to date with changes that had been made. So there was a lack of consistency across the documentation that was being given out to students. So there was a lot of confusion there, and we were seeing that uh, coming through uh, some of the EQ support tickets that we that were, uh, could read through in the past. Um, as I said, the word template and LaTeX template, uh, well, at least the word template in this instance, uh, was heavily customized because we took it upon ourselves at that time, uh, from my understanding, um, to make sure that a lot of accessibility standards uh, that we thought would be needed uh, were incorporated. So the, the creation of the bookmarks for the PDFs version uh, of each ETD were something we used a word to facilitate um, but it required a lot of uh, education on the students of how to make that happen uh, in consistency within the styles uh, and formatting and creating the guidelines. So the student, students that we find often lacked experience using word templates. Um, yes, they could create a word document, but understanding how to use styles and how those styles could, could be altered if you're just cutting and pasting in from another document that you were working in, um, there was a large gap there in the understanding of how that was working. Um, also, our guidelines that were created for the ETDs were based upon print manuscripts. Uh, in essence, instead of looking, and this is for more particular for LaTeX, uh, they were trying to mimic how the typesetting was done on, on the uh, original print manuscripts. And that may seem you know, amenable to, mo to most uh, concepts of document creation, but there are certain conventions in Word that you had to work around uh, to make sure that, that would work and facilitate them and visually look the same in, in instance uh, the original template that I uh, started the, the renovations from um, had a lot of text boxes for the preliminary pages. So uh, a lot of students would accidentally shift the text boxes on the, on the main pages. So you would, they would be off center and they wouldn't understand how to center them because they didn't know that that was the convention that was made. Um, so basing things on a manuscript um, format and typeset uh, sounds good in practice, but can sometimes lead to problems if you don't understand uh, the limitations of the actual uh, device or application you're using to create them. Uh, similarly, the LaTeX template was very heavily customized uh, because it was drawn up in 2004. A lot of changes had happened uh, for the modern era. Uh, we came in in 2017, 2018 with the transition, which we'll talk about in a second here. But uh, if it hadn't been updated in a number of years, there are many different packages that now were in conflict. Some things had deprecated in terms of LaTeX. So um, trying to understand that we weren't the ones that actually created it and the student who had created had moved on. Um, we ran into some roadblocks there and, and there was a lot of uh, disgruntled students who couldn't get to the work they wanted to. So um, uh, I've heard this in several other presentations today, but the required forms that were all analog, so everything had to be printed out and initialed uh, with signatures from the committee members and, and the advisors. And um, so there was a, an interesting um, roadblock there for a lot of students in the timelines uh, for approval because they didn't know they had to get these forms physically signed and maybe they couldn't get them physically signed because the, the uh, advisor or faculty member wasn't in, in town, uh, they weren't available, uh, but they couldn't get something approved within the repository by this ET admin because they were still waiting on a paper form uh, and couldn't get that co communication line straightened out. Um, graduation fees were also paid in person at the student payment center on campus. Um, and that could create a problem too as well if they were trying to get something done on the weekend and they maybe couldn't get in to make payments or had other outstanding fees or something of that nature. Uh, so there was a lot of confusion of where to go to pay, um, especially as things progressed in terms of online payment uh, via uh, uh, the different modules on campus. Um, we had the UMI and ProQuest forums that we had up on, our, on the website. They were quite outdated and this was not a slight to ProQuest, this was a slight to how they, we administered uh, the documentation. But there was also an open access publishing section to those documentation that the, the, the ETD contacts in the schools weren't really aware how to answer that question to the students and the advisors didn't know either because via our, our D scholarship ePrint repository, uh, we were providing open access content uh, via the deposits, uh, but we also had a copy in ProQuest and to, the student didn't understand whether they had to pay an extra fee uh, just to get it in the repository and it was confusion and it was always a, a stumbling block for, for trying to educate everybody what that actually means and what, what they are actually paying for, what the services mean and there also was an ETD processing fee that was above and beyond that. So there was a lot of fees and, and forms that nobody understood a lot of the, the, the particular details on. Um, and the largest problem that I noticed when I first came aboard was that knowing who to ask a particular question was quite unclear. We had a 
distribution list that was entitled ETD support, which is meant to answer the, the particular formatting issues that were coming about uh, and how to correct things in, in the submission process. There was an ETD feedback distribution list that we created, which was more or less about the process in general. Uh, there was also the scholarship distribution list, was, which was answering questions about the repository and the process there. Uh, but then you also have the direct line to each of these ETD contacts uh, within uh, the particular schools that created the problem. Like, who do I ask this particular question? I have a question about copyright. Well, do I ask the person in the school? Do I ask the scholarship? Do I ask ETD feedback or support? And there was just too many places to ask a question and that became to me a problem. So as I mentioned in 2017, um, the original setup of our office, the Office of Scholarly Communication and Publishing, uh, was under the, the IT department in the University Library System. Uh, we split off just in terms of uh, how would they be managed. It was a new supervisor, and we were put into a different uh, responsibility center within the libraries. And this allowed us to then reconfigure what we were going to do for ETD support, uh, because it was, that was given to us uh, as part of our responsibilities. And in particular, I was given that responsibility for ETD support, which had been in another uh, staff member or faculty member's uh, responsibility center. Uh, so I'm coming on doing, the re I did the repository management uh, in the scholarship and worked with the, some of the ETD support uh, people there. Uh, but now I had to relearn and figure out what we could do with the process and how this was being run. And it had been, again, about, you know, almost 15 years at that point. Um, for most of this process. So we had to, to take a look and see what we could do. So the initial changes I decided to, to help work with, uh, with my supervisor, Lauren Collister, uh, we sat down and we started talking about how these different processes could be uh, envisioned in the future. And the ETD process group who had not been meeting in a most regular basis, um, we're given a new charge. We sat together, down together and said, listen, maybe we, uh, yeah, and Jonah, it's on chat, it's also putting some notes there about the, the initial abstracts. Um, the, the new charge was to actually start meeting in a more regular fashion and set up a, a project, in essence, a project management uh, setup that we could have responsibilities for certain aspects of this and, and codify things in a way that made sense. Uh, and we could actually see some, some pro progress rather than waiting for and being reactionary, we can be a little more proactive. Um, so I took it upon myself as well to look at how to do a process audit uh, looking at what had been done, getting all the information I could about how things were set up, uh, what we could do to make those changes. Because coming in from just doing repository management, having a background in reference librarianship, I understood that there may be some ways that we could work on the process and the workflow for ETD support. If I treated it more like a technical support as well, uh, because it's not necessarily reference. This isn't, in essence, we're not teaching them uh, how to do research. We're, we're trying to solve a, a known solution um, to a problem they're probably having just because they didn't see this particular aspect of the guidelines or this particular tutorial, they didn't go to a workshop. Um, so knowing where there were the breaking points in, in the process uh, was a way that I could then facilitate making these larger changes. Um, obviously, we knew that the templates need to be updated, so I took that upon the, part, the, the phase one of the process uh, and realized what do they actually need to see? What do the guidelines really say? And where are the guidelines out of touch with what's actually needed? Um, that was part of the, the project management uh, application I, I was looking at to say, ask why five times? Because there's probably a reason why something was decided upon in 2004 uh, that's not necessarily required now. And it may be a problem with the, the application, say Word or LaTeX, that we can just change the guidelines. Um, if, if this is the group that makes the rules, let's see if we can change the rules. And that sounds pithy in some way, but um, I decided that might be a solution. Why, why do we have to try and break an application to fit a, a particular guideline if we can just make the guideline change? Um, at the same time, we were also doing a website reset. So we were able to take the website out of the hands of the Office of the Provost, even though they still were there to uh, give approval to the website and the content that's there. It was now under the, the responsibility of the university libraries and we created it in Drupal uh, and we re-envisioned it. Um, we can take a look at that later. And there's a link here, I believe in the slides, but um, we tried to set up a more or less a journey, a process of like, okay, now we're, we're, we're writing our document, we're formatting it, and then we're submitting it, and what happens after I submit it. So we, we tried to make it into a three-step process with all the different iterations of what could be useful for the students at those times. Uh, and that allowed us to then also look and see what's really out of date. What areas can we change to, to uh, make sure that it actually helps the student rather than just confuse them? Um, at the same time, the ETD support services perhaps needed a bit of an update as well. 
Um, at the time, the services were, were this uh, staff member, or faculty member, I guess he's a librarian, I apologize. Uh, um, he would be in one office, but he had moved office several times. Uh, they had ETD support students that were assisting, uh, but they could often be in, in different locations. There was no set location in the library, so you had to kind of look for them and find them, which I thought was, was quite odd. Uh, why have a service point that's moving um, across the library? Um, it didn't really, to me, facilitate actual uh, consistent support. Uh, if nobody knew where to find you, they're not going to come to find you. Um, so we also looked at making a ETDQ in our lib answers from SpringShare. Uh, originally, the, the libraries had a basic just one queue for all answers to come for reference librarians uh, or any questions to the library. Uh, but we had made a particular queue for the archives, special collections, and we made one for ETD support at that time. And using that system, I was able to not only make sure we had a, a particular queue for ETDs, but we were using the libchat functionality, uh, as we'll see in, in a bit here, uh, and the FAQs and things of that nature to sort of make sure everything consistently uh, says the same thing and we're giving the same message in different venues. So, um, so we also then at, from the ETD process group, and I'm gonna speed through these, I don't wanna go too much into the details, there's a lot here. Uh, we had three different phases we're working on. We're, we're right now in phase three, but in phase one of the, of the process, uh, process group's plan uh, for making sure this, this, this workflow goes well, um, we were looking to, to get out of the paper forms as much as we could. Uh, the first thing to go was the ProQuest paper forms that we were always giving out in, in packets and, uh, to the students. Uh, so we started using the ETD administrator form. However, the problem with that is we, we don't use the ETD administrator form to actually deliver the content. Uh, that was just to get the metadata and make sure they, they understood that we were going to be delivering their, their ETDs to, to ProQuest at some point. Uh, so there was, again, more confusion there from a lot of the staff members and what this really means. They don't see the, the submissions there. Um, so it was a, a stopgap solution at the time. Uh, but it was, again, trying to get out of making sure there's all these paper forms floating around. We don't really need those. We can do things electronically and have the same uh, uh, end result. We also set apart uh, in, in the Office of Scholarly Communication and Publishing to reduce the embargo lengths. We had a maximum of five years that students could ask for right out of the gate. Uh, we decided to take that down to two. Um, maximum of two years of the initial, they could request an extension of another two, up to another two years. So maybe a maximum of four if they, they were as proactive to do that. Uh, but we were trying to limit the amount of time that they would be sitting within uh, University of Pittsburgh only access uh, because we, we wanted to promote open access publishing uh, and get the, the ETDs out to the world. Um, and it's, we haven't had a lot of negative feedback on that. So we, we do believe that's been a positive and it helps us to reach out and educate not only the students, but the advisors and faculty members and staff members in each of the schools about what open access really means and, and what the, the positives are for open access. Um, the ETD approval form was also made into a fillable PDF, uh, not an online form. We didn't really get into DocuSign at that time, but at least giving the students uh, uh, the ability to create this, this form easier than having to get Adobe Pro and things of that nature. Um, it helped a little, and we're still working on that as we go forward. Um, the ETD site featured a lot more updates and training and best practices in the back end. Uh, so we were able to create those as a sort of suite to get onboarding uh, as we incorporate that into our annual meetings where we would sit down and talk with new ETD contacts was we had a number of schools uh, that had some turnover in their, their approvers. And so we had to train new people each year. Uh, and it became problematic if, if they didn't have this sort of wealth of knowledge from doing it for 10 years, uh, how do you get them up to speed and know that all the resources that have in front of them? Uh, so we started trying to have annual meetings where we could talk about the problems they see coming up, uh, making sure they're aware of all the options they have for support and where to get answers. Um, and again, I was working through trying to make sure that ET support was uh, simplified. It was a one channel. Uh, we got rid of the ETD feedback distribution list and all those other distribution lists made it into the, uh, the form that we have on our site. And we also started to incorporate um, ways to schedule meetings with uh, the specialist, myself and Jonah uh, McAllister Erickson, who, who works more or less in copyright and also with a lot of the formatting um, that we do for ETDs. And, he, and uh, it was very helpful for the students to have names that they could put uh, to the support and, and request one-on-one -on -one consultations with us, even at our office physical locations. Um, phase two, we were working to integrate the pro and this was uh, started in, in fiscal year 2019, so this would have been uh, last, the end of last year, um, integrating the ProQuest agreement into our de-scholarship workflows. So instead of making it, a, a, having to go to ETD administrator, we were working to put it directly into de-scholarship, 
uh, to eliminate even another form. It was, this would just be another, right before the license agreement and due scholarship, you would see a, an agreement saying uh, you were, we will also be submitting your work to ProQuest um, and give them a link to create an account there uh, to f facilitate any other of the services they wanted to acquire uh, via ProQuest. Um, we we're also working to adjust the thesis and dissertation processing fee, which hadn't changed and uh, or had changed slightly, uh, but didn't really factor in the, the amount of processing that was required for different types of, of ETDs and different schools and what the, the money was actually going towards for ETD support. Uh, so we were working on that. Um, integrated into that was also looking at what the costs were for microfilm because our theses were sent to one vendor and dissertations were sent to another. So trying to figure out how we could uh, uh, balance out some of those costs and and uh, get the services we actually needed. Um, we were looking at doing online payment and how that could be uh, done through the student payment center. Uh, and that had been working, that's something more or less that the registrar and the provost were working on. The libraries weren't as involved in that, but we were there to, to help lend any possible tech solutions we had heard of, or we had used for our own purchasing within the libraries uh, for things like our archival uh, collections and purchasing copies and things like that. Um, the graduate milestone forms were, were made standardized across the schools. That was, again, a back-end solution of how to, to uh, keep track of where students were in the process. Um, we were, again, making sure that ETD approval forms could be managed in DocuSign. We're working with the IT departments to try and figure out what would be the best way to do that. And each of the schools had to, to be amenable to that as well, which, again, decentralization has its, its pluses and minuses, and that's one of them, is making sure everybody's doing it the same way. Um, the provost also wanted to push exit survey changes, so that had to be... Uh, pulled into the, the, the process and figured out how we can make sure we could just change one out for the next one next year. And we were looking at alternative uh, preservation options, meaning that we didn't want to keep collecting microfilm if possible, but there was still uh, a longstanding tradition of keeping uh, microfilm and we didn't have a secondary digital solution ready. Uh, although our repository is a great digital solution for preservation uh, and dissemination of these ETDs, we needed to find a secondary solution that archival, uh, the archives and special collections unit would support and we're still getting that. So. On um, the phase three here, um, this is where we're going uh, soon. We're going to be starting at, at this semester, uh, looking at the DocuSign milestones, things of that nature, um, developing a process for, for erratum uh, requests, which is already technically there, but we're going to make sure that it gets uh, codified in the right way and that uh, we have that process ready to go, much the same way for requesting embargoes and how that works. That was always it's kind of hidden behind the scenes. So we're making sure that's going to be uh, in the forefront of our site that people, if they need that question answered, they can get it there. Um, looking at how we do quality assurance uh, data for the process, we're going to do another process audit and we're going to enlist some uh, third party entities in the university, if you will, not involved in the process to look at it and give us feedback on things we can do to improve in all aspects of the process for ETDs. Um, and also review, and I heard this in several other presentations, or at least one other presentation I require, uh, I recall that uh, looking at how committee members can do remote uh, participation, which is already happening before COVID, um, but making sure that we have that standardized and everybody's in agreement and understands the process and it gets all the forms in order uh, because it, it definitely is something we, we were worried about because it had happened before. We had to make special uh, consolidations uh, for uh, doing that uh, previously. Um, we also wanted to review and recommend changes to the, the university regulations gra governing uh, graduate study. Um, and so this, we had to make sure the university was going to allow us, even though the provost office is the one who controls the, the, the larger process of the ETDs, there are issues about these changes and making sure that they fit into to the university's uh, role as a whole uh, and, and rules and regulations, if you will. Um, so, and again, the, the making sure all the forms are in order and working properly for everybody who's involved and we get the output we need and how do we uh, control those? Because again, everybody was using paper forms. They were keeping in file folders within each office. And now how do we help them to facilitate all these different uh, electronic forms? How do they store them? How do they manage them? And, and what happens and what's the uh, retainment uh, schedule and things like that. But as we all know, um, and now for something completely different, the pandemic hit in March. And it threw a bit of a monkey wrench into a lot of our plans. Um, so we had to start thinking ahead and we're doing it quickly. Um, the, we closed campus March 2020 and uh, the ETD services that were immediately impacted, at least in the library side of things, uh, were walk-in support. We had a walk-in support desk that we had finally put a sign up for and people were, were uh, visiting quite regularly. Uh, however, now they couldn't be there because the libraries were closed. The formatting workshops were all done in person at our main library location. Every once in a while we would do a satellite one at a, at a, a particular uh, 
departmental site. Uh, however, again, we, we couldn't facilitate, we didn't have the right application uh, for performing uh, workshops online. We could have used something like Panopto. Uh, we'd even given the thought to something like Skype or doing some YouTube live. Um, this was prior to COVID, obviously, since the pandemic. We, we were um, just talking about how we could reach out to students who were not in Pittsburgh. Uh, we have a lot of students who were, were ABD or they were, they were you know, non-traditional students who weren't living on campus. They were doing remote education, but they, they couldn't attend these workshops. So we, we made a video prior to this as well, but we needed a way to actually perform these workshops. Uh, and this gave us a, a really good uh, arguing point to say we need an application that will do this. Um, students couldn't access computer labs anymore. So how can we help them format a document if they didn't have all the software that was available to them and we actually were suggesting to them uh, if they had no access to those particular um, the computers. Um, the forms obviously couldn't be physically delivered. So luckily we were already thinking along the lines of getting rid of all those physical forms, but there were still some things that were physical at that time. Uh, and ETD contacts and support staff were all starting to work remotely, including at the, the time we had two student assistants, one actually left the, the university prior to uh, the, the, the closing. Uh, so we were left with one student who I had to try and coordinate with and also were working on their own, um, their own studies uh, to make sure we can get this all straightened through. And even though they were technically hired by the, the libraries, they're not staff, so there's different limitations to what they could access, what they could do, uh, and, and the software they had. And I don't know what type of technology they had at the time. So it was a lot of figuring that out. Um, so there's a link to the, the notice we put up. It's still there uh, for, for COVID-19. And we decided to say, well, what can we do for walk-in services? Well, what if we just use the Libd Answers chat service uh, the, from Springshare LibChat uh, to be there for the same hours that we had for walk-in in our office? Um, I would say that you could use, if, if your library has any sort of chat like that and the ability to make, create multiple queues, that's a great solution uh, to, to uh, change up your walk-in services, just make them uh, visit us at this chat location. Um, we have a, a, um, uh, an office, uh, or actually our sister office, in, in the, uh, the digital scholarship um, services office who do a sort of open office Zoom meeting, like a Zoom conference meeting. Um, and we gave, right, we gave a thought to that and said, well, that would be an interesting idea, but at the same time, it's hard to have a queue of people coming into an open office for ETD support. It used to be different. We had a, a desk where they could sit at and say, excuse me, I'll be right with you, uh, helping somebody else here. We can, we can grab my colleague here. Uh, but we thought it might be a bit more uh, interruptive to the process. Uh, so having the, the chat is easier for one person to manage. We can then create tickets directly from that if we need to send it out. Uh, so it's a little bit easier to manage that way. Uh, and we had our ETD support, OSCP and ETD support assistant working remotely with the chat basically. So they could do that on their own, be still working on their own uh, studies uh, and, and yeah, be facilitating chat. For the workshops, we were lucky the pit got to Zoom and we were able to, to then just easily say, we're gonna start scheduling them via LibCal, which is also a SpringShare product. And we could provide a, a Zoom workshop that we customized ourselves, create our own presentations uh, and new slides and, um, uh, figured out a way to do sort of live captioning using uh, Google Slides in the background, um, which is not perfect, but at least allows us to make sure that we have uh, some ability to create captioning while we're talking. Um, and so that's been working out great. We actually have seen an uptick uh, on the number of people who, who will be attending. Uh, less people don't show up, I should say as well. We often have a lot of people who would sign up for every workshop in the semester and then only show up to one. So your numbers seemed odd when you're looking at the possible people who'd be registered. Uh, but now more people are showing up and it gives them, I think, a little bit easier uh, of a time uh, to, to be able to manage it in the timing of, of their work day and, and such. Um, the no access to computer labs was a problem, like I said, but Pitt IT released a virtual lab instance uh, that mimicked the, the same software that would be on the, the computing labs that we had in our library. So we were able to allow to push people to that and say, hey, if you don't have this on your computer, here's, here's a version on a PC that you can use. Because if you're not familiar with what goes on with um, Word for Mac, it's a different client than on PC. And there's a limitation to how it creates a PDF because we don't actually force them to use um, force them to use Adobe Acrobat to create their PDFs. We can do it direct, strictly through Word uh, using the styles that we've created and, and some of the formatting we've done to the template. And unfortunately, if they have a really large file, uh, it will just error out and crash Word for Mac. So having an option for them to go and use a virtual PC ha has been really good. Um, 
And the, the forms, as we said, we created really quickly a, a fillable PDF form, got permission for doing that. And there was a mandate that went out from the provost that said, you don't have to get everything signed in person. An email is fine. We're going to make this work. We're not going to worry about some of those particulars. So that may change as we go forward. But at the time, that was what, what was happening. Um, we are all working remotely and, and we're probably going to be working remotely uh, until there's a, a solution that makes sense for us because we had an open office. Uh, it's tough for us to come back on and schedule that. So we, we are being uh, delightfully for me uh, asked to stay home as long as we can uh, until, until there's a solution in general for, for the population here. Uh, so we had to start talking to the staff that were also staying home with the reviewers who in these different schools. Uh, how can we support them and talk about ways to use uh, the technology at hand? And one of the things that I uh, suggested early on as a possible solution prior to the, the shutdown was to use Adobe Acrobat. Uh, and so it, to step back one second here to say that our process is they, the students submitted the PDF version uh, in D scholarship. And what had happened previously to um, uh, in previous years was that the, the reviewers would look at that, they would create notes in a separate file, send that file as an email and return the, the, the PDF and the record uh, to the user work area in, these, in our D scholarship or ePrints repository. Uh, so there was often this disconnect where there was an email that had all the particular details for what was wrong with the, the ETD, uh, but not necessarily the, um, uh, when they came to ETD support, they would say, you send us a message saying something was wrong with our ETD. Well, we weren't the ones who did it. We don't know what they're talking about. And, and there may be a disconnect of the Word version versus the PDF versus the notes that were sent. So one of the things I suggested was using Adobe Acrobat to annotate directly on the PDF version that they sent. Um, and they could create a second version of it and send it back with them in D scholarship and upload it that way. And it allowed us to be able to go in and access that directly and say, ah, oh, they're talking about this. Here's what they really want to see. Here's what they're talking about in the guidelines and so on and so forth. So I was able to uh, offer uh, tutorials to the staff members to sit down and talk about, well, here's the changes we made to the, to the templates. Here's how a common solution to this problem you may even be able to suggest rather than have, us, have them come to us. Um, not everybody takes us up on that, but it, just trying to educate the staff members to make sure that they have the ability uh, to work with the students in a more streamlined way uh, lessens some of that confusion. Um, using Box, OneDrive, and an overly for the LaTeX um, templates has been great because we can then use the Zoom consultations if they need to, uh, to work with them directly or just provide them the, the, the solutions uh, via Box or OneDrive uh, and, and not have to worry about the email chains that have given nowhere. We can make sure they're all, all in Box, annotate there, uh, provide comments, put it in a ticket in our living answer system, what have you. Uh, so that's been a really useful tool, having some sort of collaborative space uh, to work from. Um, and because we're decentralized, we don't often involve the reviewers in that formatting review, or at least the formatting changes that we're doing. They tell us what they need to, you know, what needs to be done before they'll approve it, and we try to go from there and work with them. Um, we also linked our calendars and Outlook to a LibCal, which is a, another SpringShare project, so the whole suite, not trying to sell SpringShare, but it, it's been working for us. Um, and allowed students to request Zoom consultations with myself or Jonah. Uh, during our normal office hours. So again, we set our hours in Outlook and, and it goes from there. Um, so looking at the avenues of opportunity, I, in my opinion, what, what things could work in different processes, everybody's different. And again, ours being a decentralized process has its pluses and minuses, but I always think having agile solutions versus fixed. Uh, one of the things I really wanna see change in the future um, is this sort of strict ETD formatting and review process. We have people who will, you know, if there's something off by an eighth of an inch between a spacing of a line, they're sending it back. Or if the, the block quote is not justified properly because it's, it's not using the block justification, the left, right justification is using left, uh, things like that, that I, I feel are not necessarily the biggest problem in, in terms of making a document and, and typesetting. I would like to see more flexibility in terms of accessibility and adaptability in, in different ETDs, even in the PDF form. I know we're talking beyond the PDF as we go forward, and what other ways we can collect information and documents and, and supplementary materials and things of that nature. But even in terms of if one student in physics writes a particular document this way, because that's how their discipline writes documents and formats things, versus um, this is a, a uh, student in, in the arts who's doing it this way, um, how can we come together and say, this, this is all that's really needed. Uh, the accessibility of the document, make sure the links work, making sure it's consistently formatted within its own environment, uh, rather than it has to be this particular guideline of, of typesetting 
that really doesn't change anything in how people read the information. It's just a, it's just a formatting to be formalized. Uh, so that's my particular opinion on that. I'm hoping to keep working with them on, on uh, allowing students to have a more individualized voice in the typesetting, and just so we make it work for people who want to read it. Um, Centralized management can be a problem though. I think some people are, are quite tied to that. Uh, I like the decentralized model in some ways because it allows us to seek partnerships uh, to educate others in the, in the staff on these different uh, uh, ideas. Um, five minutes, I can see it already. Um, <laughs> I'll try to zoom through this. So um, what are we gonna do uh, in terms of the future? What are things I think are probably gonna come up and, and that'd be a problem? Uh, I'm not sure how remote services are gonna continue when we're back in the office. Um, I hope that we can find a nice hybrid model uh, and ways to, to support the students. And again, we had already been thinking about some of these issues in terms of how do we reach out to students uh, who are remote? Uh, what can we do to help them with the technology gap they may have without having the applications we suggest? Uh, and, and reach out about education, some of the, the, the open access, especially um, um, concepts that we promote. Um, what can we do to make the templates more user-friendly? Now, we also have an accessibility mandate coming up. Uh, so we're gonna have to really climb a quite steep, quite of a steep mountain to figure out how we can integrate all these accessibility uh, concepts into our processes. Uh, and I am not looking forward to that, but I do like a challenge, so that's gonna be fun. Um, what other aspects need attention in the process? Again, that process audit might bring that up. We might also see things that we weren't aware of on the library side that would come out of the administrative side of the process. Um, how can we also reach out for and gather an audience for niche, niche things that, that we may not have been offering before? We don't offer a lot tech tutorial right now, or at least a workshop, and we may have to start doing that. Uh, and I'm the, the closest thing we have to an expert in the libraries in that, and I don't consider myself an expert. So uh, again, another challenge we'll have to figure out. Granted, Overleaf might be our solution for that, but uh, we need to figure out what other ways, what other things students need to see. Um, and also what other ways can we support staff members in our schools uh, so they can be more independent on how they do feedback. That's always the thing that I wanna to try to support. I don't want them to always feel like they're helpless. I don't wanna feel like they don't have an answer to this. There's a lot of answers we can provide quite quickly uh, and we can just put into an FAQ or put into a standardized document behind the scenes so they can feel like, ah, I know this already. I've done this before, here it is. Um, what, what can we do to facilitate that? Um, so the last slide is questions. I know this seems dramatic, um, but this is literally a slide the university gives us out for putting in slide decks, and that's the cathedral learning. It, I swear it also doesn't have a laser and is not on fire, but uh, there's a good question for that. <laughs> so, John, thank you very much. That was very comprehensive, and um, really the decentralized environment harkens back to my days at West Virginia University in herding cats. And yes. I'll just be <laughs> polite about it, but it was a, it's always a huge challenge with decentralized environments. Um, we have a couple sure. of questions in the chat panel here. Maybe I can read them to you. Um, first one is, um, for what spectrum of circumstances would you allow uh, an er erratum? Sure, um, so far we only had a few. Uh, normally we try to, to stay away from uh, sort of vanity changes. Uh, it, I hate to say that it sounds, uh, sounds again not really professional to say it that way but if somebody just wants to change a particular name of something in, in, in this or they had a capitalization problem or something those are probably not going to be approved it's really we've had one where somebody had the wrong factor in one of their their ta data tables uh, so it was like that's research is going to cause a problem so we need to fix that uh, we allowed them to make that change uh, we also had several instances where if there was somebody was saying an abusive relationship uh, where they, they needed to um, change something because they felt like it was going to be a problem. Um, that we, we put that through the provost and, and it was allowed to, to do that. Um, so we have some basic guidelines, but it's, it's still up to the, the, the school and the provost office. There's a two-tiered approval to that. So it goes to the school, the dean of the school, and they say, yes, that, that will be allowed. Then it goes to the provost and they say, yes, we'll allow that too. And then we create a new copy, put the erratum on there and go forward. So, yeah. Very good. I swear to God, I heard a cat. Meowing. There was a cat, yeah. Is it when somebody liked to comment herding cats? That was my favorite <laughs> phrase, too. So next question here. we got another minute or so. Sure. Um, do you have any recommendations for digitizing the print copies of thesis and dissertations from years and decades past um, before electronic submissions? And are you contacting those people asking for permission to digitize? Sure. We, we don't. That's not something we are definitely. Well, I've always thought we should do that. We don't have that process in place right now. However, we do have an option for if a uh, author comes to us and says, I'd like to digitize my thesis, 
Um, the process we have is we basically just say, yes, we'll do that as long as you allow us to put it in scholarship. Uh, as long as you, the digital copy will be available to the world, we'll do that for you for nothing. Uh, we do it in-house for like, I think it's $25, $30, something like that, if they just want to have a copy for themselves, uh, which sounds weird, but they can then get a, a, you know, a print copy made as well. Um, of the digital version. Um, but we, we really haven't looked to see what vendors we would use for digitization. We may do it in-house. We have a pretty uh, prolific uh, uh, digital library team here that could possibly help with that and facilitate that. But uh, it's not something that the university has asked for. So we're still waiting on that because obviously that will be the, the, the uh, impetus to that, so. Okay, one quick final question. Mm -hmm. Is Pitt still using ePrints? Yes, we are. Not for much longer. Um, we're actually in the process of looking for a repository uh, alternative. Uh, we just feel like ePrints has, has had a long life and it's probably at the end of its, uh, in my opinion, and some of our other staff members, um, that we would like to move forward to something else. But we haven't picked one out yet. We're, we're literally at the beginning of that process. Um, but ePrints has been good, but it's just the support isn't there in the community, in my opinion, uh, to continue okay. with what we need to do. Great, great. Thank you. I think the suggestion here is that um, you could work with ProQuest to harvest out things, but you can read that chat. Oh, very good ProQuest. Um, possible we... solutions. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, that was um, quite informative. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, thank you very much from our, my esteemed colleague in Pittsburgh, just 50 miles up the road from here. So. <laughs>